The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com. Hello and welcome back to the Bed and Hex Show. As you can see, I've been making some progress on my steampunk outfit. I've also made progress on the LED Persistence of Vision display. Let's take a look. It's like a 1890 Oculus Rift. You know, I'm gonna watch some Nickelodeon movies of a train coming into a station. Oh my God. Thomas Edison, you've done it again. Amazing builds, exclusive mods, cutting edge ideas, electronics, engineering, and more. Every week on Element 14's The Ben Heck Show. In the previous episode, we hooked up a roll of LEDs and we drove them with a microcontroller. In this episode, we need to make that roll of LEDs spin rapidly to create the illusion for persistence of vision, or the illusion of persistence of vision. Or maybe it would be an illusion because of the persistence of vision. Yeah, I think that's the best one. So this is going to be free spinning. This is the disc. To get power and data to it, we're going to use these spring-loaded carbon brushes. They look actually look more like rods. They're small little carbon rods that are spring-loaded, and we're going to have them in their own little wells like this, and they'll be pushing out against the spinning PCB disc. So the power and data can be transmitted to the free spinning LED drum through these carbon brushes. So we're going to laser cut a big rig that we can build all this into. We'll put the carbon brushes on the end and see if we can get power to go to the LEDs. Now I'm going to use the shop bot to actually mill the brush circles for our PCBs. And I've got my small 1 16th inch bit in there so I can mill around it. Some people use a V bit, but I don't have one of those, so I'm just gonna use this. Uh, hopefully it'll work. We're gonna have to clean off the back side of the copper because it's double-sided copper, but we only need to do that where the Vs are. So I think there's a pretty decent chance this will work, as long as my bit doesn't break. So let's get started. Are you ready? Kick it. Yes, tool number two is in the spindle. Well, hopefully this works. I guess we'll see. Ha 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 The power of the sun in the palm of my hand. While the shop bot mills the PCB, I'm gonna get started on the gearing mechanism. Here we have a DC motor, and I actually pulled this out of a cheap drill from Menards, and we've made a PET-G laser cut gear for it. And then I've removed some portions of the PET-G to make it lighter. Now this is gonna be our drive gear, and we have what looks to be like a two to one gear ratio. I've already forgotten what I did. So this gear is going to spin at a certain speed and it's going to spin a smaller gear, which will make the actual unit spin even faster than the motor can go. It's better for it to go faster than slower because we can always slow it down with an H bridge, but we can't speed it up necessarily. So here's how this goes together. So we have a 14 millimeter skate bearing, which goes into this part of the gear. And then our bolt goes here. And the bolt actually touches the inside of the bearing, so this will spin freely around it. Then what we do is we attach this whole portion to our PCB. This is a test PCB we have laying around. We're just gonna use it for an example right now. Now these holes line up, see that? Okay. And then we wanna make sure it's really got a good grip. So I 3D printed this, and this has an opening for the bolt. And this actually presses against the PCB holding it even better. Then there's a slot in it here, and that's what's actually gonna hold the portion that rotates, the uh, LED board portion. All right, so let me just, I'm not gonna put the lock nuts in this yet, because this is just a test. All right, oh, went too far on that one. Okay, we're gonna put this nut on the bolt and it's going to grip on the other side of the bearing. So what happens is basically the, um, the bolt and the nuts are inert. They don't move. The bearing spins around them. So 
See that? Okay, so put that in here. There's a little bit of a gap created by the bolt, but that's okay. And this nut will hold the bolt in place on the main mount. Yeah, there we go. So the tab down here is going to go into an opto detector and say, oh, there's the start of the frame. So that when the tab is down here, see how it's a little bit offset? That will actually start the frame. So start of the frame and then draw the dots. Null frame, start of the frame, draw the dots. So it can time how fast it's going. Therefore, the microcontroller could actually speed up or slow down the motor depending on the frequency that it's detecting. That is assuming this all works. I mean, why wouldn't it work? Moves at a pretty good clip, even at 3.3 volts. Here's our milled PCB, and there's three data lines per side. And then we made a little offset here so we can drill a hole through and get the via for the data to take it into the lights, but the brush won't hit it because the brush is smaller than that. So the brush is this wide, which is about 3 16 and we'll attach the wires right there. Now these are brushes. They're gonna be spring-loaded, and they'll press against it. Of course, they'll be you know, captured so they can't move. So as this thing spins, they maintain contact. Now I'm gonna try some PCB etchant on it. Hmm, yeah, you know what, I'm not gonna use a sponge. I'm gonna use Q-tips. This stuff looks like iodine. Do not use this on your cut or wound. We just need to remove enough copper so that we don't have a short on the other side of where those vias are gonna be. Now it's time for a tech timeout. So far in this project, we've had some PCBs made by an external board house, and then we also made some circular ones using the CNC machine. So I thought we could go over a few more methods that people use to make their own PCBs. So yes, a milling is pretty popular. You can make a small CNC mill. It doesn't need a lot of force like some CNC projects do. And you basically just scrape off the top of the copper and then sometimes you make a perimeter, although sometimes it's hard to keep the piece down. Another thing that's popular is to either iron on or put on adhesive decals onto a blank piece of copper. And these decals would be the shape of traces or you could print out a decal using a transparency paper and iron it onto the PCB. And then you stick that into an agitated etchant bath. And after a while, it eats away the exposed copper and hopefully just leaves the copper that you covered up with your adhesive or decal traces. Another method is to use a PCB with a UV reactive layer. It's kind of the same thing where you put on traces and to cover it up and then you hit it with a UV light. Whatever the UV light hits, that is the copper that is exposed and that copper will be removed by the etchant bath. Everything left over will remain on the board. And then the end result is a final PCB. Of course, with this method, you're gonna to have to drill your own holes, which unless it's surface mount, that could take a while. So maybe use surface mount. That's another reason to use surface mount. No holes to drill. So yeah, um, on a future episode, I think it'd be fun to um, do these two methods and see which one actually works better for us. But there's actually a lot of ways you can roll your own PCB. Uh, just take some time, research, and patience. Today will be Phil's moment of greatness. The culmination of two years of all-nighters, constant research, and secretive configurations. Today, investors will shower Phil with praise and grant him the funding he needs to realize his dream. Today, Phil's brilliance will be unleashed onto the world. There's just one problem. Phil didn't go to Element 14 to order the right parts for his prototype. 
Take your build from design to production with the world's leading electronics community. Start today at element14.com. Here is our copper clad disc, and I've attached the uh, wires to the edges here, and the reason I did it like that was so there's enough room for the brushes to move around, so they don't actually hit where the wires are. That's why there's a good decent gap between them. These are some carbon brushes that I bought, and here's how this is going to work. This is going to bolt in here, which we showed earlier, and if you look through these holes, those three holes there, you can see how it lines up to the copper tracks that we made. Yeah. Okay. So we're gonna stack up these pieces here. We're gonna have two layers on this side, and the brushes are gonna go into that. And then this one has smaller holes, so it will hold the brush in place. And the thing that keeps the brushes from popping out is the fact that they're going to be attached you know, or they're, they're going to be pushing against the copper plate. Okay, so I've actually got to attach wires to these brushes before I continue because they're gonna be, well, they won't be permanently trapped, but they're definitely gonna be in there. Let's test the connections. The middle one is obvious. All right. Cool, we've got a nice solid connection. Let's see what it actually is in ohms. Ah, it looks like 7.3 ohms. That's not bad at all. I've run into a critical problem with this. These brushes, while they work, it creates friction on the spinning disc, and this motor is now inadequate. So I've got to use a bigger motor in order to make this work. So this is a big problem. I think what we might be able to do is use a larger motor from a more full-size drill. See, there's quite a difference there. So I'm gonna go get another drill, take its motor out, rebuild this frame and put it in and see if that gives us enough torque. The problem here is we need both torque and speed, but we don't have a whole lot of room to do it in. And I really can't recut this, so I've got to keep the same gear ratio. So time to find another drill motor. So I've attached a much larger motor that was donated by one of my old drills. And I didn't have to change too much. It still has a lot of friction from the carbon brushes, but I think it'll work. And then here's the opposite side of it. So there are mirror images of each other. And between them, we will attach the spinning portion. And we built this in the last episode, although we need to make a larger frame. Excuse me. So this will basically slot in like this. And then this will spin it around, hopefully creating the persistence of vision effect. So we've got three lines on this side, data clock latch, and then two lines on this side for power and ground. Let's test it out with the new motor. Whoa. I don't think it needs to go that fast. Also, we have the opto interrupter here so it can get the timing and uh, figure out what the RPMs are, basically. I wonder if we can run it at three. Now that we know that it will spin, it's time to make the bracing between the halves and see if it'll spin the whole kit and caboodle. Let's do that. I'm gonna bolt this to the new frame and then we'll see if it spins. I put a big gaping hole in it, so uh, it'll help with balance and also this will weigh less, basically. <laughs> it will have less mass, and there'll be less mass effect on the motors. I'm gonna go for it. I am gonna jump in and jam it. <laughs> oh, Shania. I wanna be bam, bam, bam. 
sledgehammer. <laughs> now I've got that song stuck in my head. <laughs> bum, 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 bum. Let's try to run this. Mm. Still. Yeah, it's drawing a lot of current, it still has friction issues. I'm gonna test it without the brushes and see just how much friction those brushes are adding. All right, let's see what happens without the brushes. Wow, that makes a huge difference. I can't even really hold it steady. If only Allison were here to help. Yeah, get in there. Yeah, that's a big difference. I mean, obviously it's not mounted very well, but it obviously moves. Hmm, we've got to make those brushes, I don't know, we just have to reduce the resistance on them. Man, that's a huge difference. I wanna be, damn, sloth hammer. I shaved down the carbon contacts to reduce the friction. Let's try them out. I don't have data hooked up, but we've got the power on it so we can at least kind of see the effect. Whoa. Well, filing down those carbon brushes really reduced the friction quite a bit and got that puppy spinning. In the next episode, we'll hook it back up to the microcontroller and see if we can get some dots and lines and patterns to synchronize with the rotation. In the meantime, I'm gonna add some gears to my steampunk outfit. We'll see you next time. Don't forget, you can subscribe to this channel, join the Element 14 community, follow us on Twitter, and become our friend on Facebook. Mulder and Scully stop the 2012 alien invasion and film it soon before they look too much older. Also, Mulder punches an alien in the scene. And he's like, that's for my sister. <laughs> do, 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 do. Okay, you have to have that in the episode. <laughs> <laughs> the Ben Heck Show was brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com.